Well, I'm uh, excited for us to be here today have this conversation. Um, I'm Nancy Smith, um, the UB School of Social Work, and uh, we have as a guest speaker um, visiting campus, Mike Langlois, who's here to talk to us about technology and social work practice. And um, so we thought we would just get together to have a little bit of a conversation. We have no idea what we're going to talk about, <laughs> uh, but maybe just a chance to uh, explore this topic a little bit. Um, and then we'll be getting lots more from him as he visits us, but this is a way for us to share a little bit with the world. So um, Mike and I got together um, with a Google Groups community on uh, social work and technology and asked for some suggestions about what we should talk about. Now, I don't know that we're going to be talking about those things, but uh, we did get some input from people. So, yeah, We really wanted to try to get some ideas, and one of the things we wanted to do and the reason we're doing it this way is because this interaction is sort of what gets us excited about technology. The idea that it, there is a bit of an organic quality to it and a lot of times people don't assume technology has a relational or organic quality. They kind of confuse technology with mechanisms or technology with gadgets and so what you're seeing here is actually what some of the power of technology can be which is very interactive. Um, and so hopefully what we're going to do today is have a conversation that will get people excited about learning about technology and excited about understanding it as relational. Yeah. I mean, I think um, one of the ideas we had about to talk about that was most exciting to, to me, and um, I think you said the same thing, was just the thought about what gets us excited about technology. and. Um, it's, it's actually, for me, not this idea of all these cool apps that do this, this, or this. I mean, it is about how it enhances relationship and community and how we can use it for, for some exciting things. For instance, I met you over Twitter right. and uh, then through your blog, and that would not have happened um, five years ago even, probably, because those were not ways everybody was connecting as much. You were still doing your thing. I was doing mine, but I don't think I was connecting as much with a community of people um, who were doing cool things in social work. So uh, bringing people together like that, I think, is one of the things about technology that excites me. And I think it's interesting that when people look at folks on social media, they if they meet people these ways, they tend to still want to get together face to face. Yeah. It's yeah. not like, oh, I want this in place of. It's all about relationships. So. One of the things that I noticed, we, had, we kind of get siloed down in academia where everybody may be doing interesting things, but they're doing them in their own particular institution. Yeah. And we did about a year ago a Google Hangout where you and I and Jonathan Singer and Karen Zagoda uh, and a couple other people all kind of beamed in from all over different parts of the U.S. And after that conversation, I remember thinking, that this is really invigorating. I feel like I've had some real neat interchange of ideas. And I think sometimes when people have areas of specialty that are in some ways isolating, they may not be able to, to find peers and camaraderie in quite the same way without, mm -hmm. without the opportunities that having Google Hangouts did, for example. Mm -hmm. so, so I think part of, part of what we're sort of talking about here is that technology is inherently social. We're, we're, we're using it to try to connect with other people. We're not necessarily um, alone. And I think the image of people using technology as sort of alone or often substituting it for a real relationship is, is something that our profession struggles with. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Sherry Turkle's work, I mean, her books just alone together is sort of captures that image of, the, of isolation. And certainly people can struggle with isolation, but they struggle with isolation outside of their own technology. Um, and so if, if you struggle with it outside of technology, you're going to struggle it with technology. Um, the, the connecting of people, um, I'm, I get most excited when it does things that we can't do without that technology. Um, so Google Hangouts was a really great example. Um, in Second Life, um, I have a community of people that I actually live with there. We, have, we share an island together, we share a community. And uh, a man who's the most amazing community organizer I've met, not a social worker I might add, just a guy who does this, brings people together and uh, you know, we're around shared projects of creating art spaces or creating um, uh, concerts where people can raise money for someone who needs it. Those kinds of things, I couldn't possibly connect with someone from Australia that way um, in my backyard, and the technology provides the way to do that. 
Um, and so it's, it is, for me, it's all about relationship, and that's why I get so excited about social work and technology, because we know how to do relationship, we know how to connect with people, um, it's just about learning how to do it in these spaces. Right. You know, it, I'm, I'm reminded of why I got very interested in video games and working with people that play video games, and it was about nine years ago playing a video game called Ultima. Um, online and I was playing in this in this game you you know run around having adventures and you can die and then you get resurrected and die and get resurrected again that happens over and over um, but there's also a chat window where you can talk or type and communicate with other people that are playing the game and as I was playing the game the social worker in me was asking questions like well where are you from or what, what are we talking about and the person that I was running around having this quest with was a veteran that was stationed in Iraq at the time and was talking about how he was actually stationed at a place where you know you could be hearing the bombs and hearing guns and I was thinking what what is the symbolic piece here where this person is playing this game with me and dying and resurrecting and dying and resurrecting when in real life they're actually facing a life-threatening issue every single day um, and so of course as a therapist I start to think well gee is this an example of a repetition compulsion or is this an example of them mastering an anxiety? And all sorts of thoughts started coming through my head that were very psychodynamic in nature. And one of the things that I've been frustrated with in terms of our field and technology is we only talk about it in terms of the more behavioral or mechanistic ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. That we talk, that, that there are CBT apps, and I'm a big fan of CBT, but I, I think just looking at technology as something that can be used for CBT or DBT misses the whole dimension of metaphor and symbolic quality that technology embodies. And that, there, that technologies mean things. That when someone posts a video, it means something. And it shapes who we are. And so the fact that Sherry Turkle is talking about object relations, I think, is wonderful. The direction she's taking it is exactly the opposite of where I want us to go. I, I don't think technology inherently is going to isolate us. I think technology is another arena in which psychodynamic conflicts and psychodynamic events are taking place. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I'm a recovering cognitive behavioral therapist, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll start by saying that. Um, and. Uh, I would agree. I think that it's too easy for us to sort of objectify the technology um, and not see it in the context of, of everything else. Um, as you were talking, um, I was thinking about um, William Powers' book, Hamlet's Black Blackberry, where he talks and says, you know, technology is neither bad nor good. It's that every new technology we develop um, because it solves problems for it. It, it, cre it's, it. And he actually talked about how the cell phone and all this mobile technology is about connecting people at a time when people are disconnected. They're in many different places. Um, and at the same time, it creates challenges for us to adapt to as a society. Um, the uh, printing press was a great example of solving the problem that people didn't have to anymore you know, transmit knowledge through writing it down, you know, and then only one person has this book that gets written down in a monastery. Now you've got all of this, this information. But people became immediately overloaded by that information. And then the question of how do you organize and keep track of it and things like encyclopedias and indexes evolved out of that. So right now, we're reacting to all this technology and you get people saying it's bad or it's good. Or, and it's kind of like it, it is what it is because we need it for certain things, but then how do we integrate it and how do we make it a force for positive? Because it could go either way, just like everything can. Right. Well, and the other interesting thing about technology, and Howard Rangel talks about this, is how it's a mind amplifier. And I would add to that that it's a feeling or affect amplifier as well. And that one of the things that we've just sort of talked about in terms of the psychodynamic and the CBT um, argument. And when I say that, I think very highly of CBT and I think it's a very effective treatment. I think psychodynamic theory is a therapy is also a very effective treatment for a lot of people. And we have had this false dichotomy and this mm. schism going with those two things. And now I'm seeing it play out in technology, where technology is being appropriated 
by one of those camps, the CBT, let's measure things camp, and the psychodynamic theory camp is coming, is taking the opposite approach of, well, technology is not really a very good thing, it's divisive, it's the relationship that matters, and I think that this is an actual example of technology amplifying an existing conflict, that there's, um, there's plenty of room for both CBT and psychodynamic oriented treatments. And I think that psychodynamic therapists need to get with the program and start using technology and Im imagining it as a set of symbols or an opportunity to manifest latent content, just like films or other art forms. Um, and I don't think we see that um, when we talk about technology. I think we really focus on the, the more behavioral and external things. And we know that um, Social work is about understanding people's internal experiences, right? Not just measuring external things. And um, technology can help with that. It's not just um, an, an app that can remind you to meditate. It's not just an app that you can track your mood. Those are useful things. But technology are these artifacts and windows into people's unconscious. And we're missing that. Mm. Now, as you're talking, I was thinking one of the things that people talk about uh, when it comes to virtual spaces is the drama that can emerge in virtual spaces uh, and between people's relationships and um, that they become sort of heightened and intensified, amplified, I guess is a good way to think of it. And for me, the uh, was really understanding that part of the reason why that happens so well with technology is you get a few words that are typed out and you have a context of a space, and then I put my whole interpretation on it. Right. So that's where the technology provides me with um, a blank screen, so I can project all of my uh, insecurity. So I hear now you know, what you've said in a very different way than somebody else might, because I brought myself to the process. Uh, the question is, how do you use that then um, as a social worker? Well, you have to be a social worker that's willing to talk about technology. Because the minute you say that, a good clinically oriented social worker is going to say, well, what did you think when you saw those few words of text? Well, how did you understand that? What was your imagination of that? We explore the projections, right? We explore the transference. That's what we're trained to do. Technology doesn't train you to explore the transference. Those are skills that social workers already have or are already working on. But think about all of the opportunities for exploring transference in a mediated way that we miss because we don't let um, someone bring their laptop in. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't, and, and think of all the problem solving we don't allow to have happen. I'm thinking of a client that uh, came in one day and my patients can bring their texts, te their cell phones in and their smartphones in because I, uh, my rule with them is if you're going to use it, you either can let me know what you're talking about and who it is, just like there was a person in the room, or if you want your privacy, you can wait, go in the waiting room, finish your conversation, and then come back. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, the adolescents I work with want me to have a part of it. And this guy was texting and he said, oh, it's this girl I like. And I said, oh, what, what's she saying? <laughs> oh, she says she's having a really bad day. What do I do? What should I say? <laughs> and I said, well, what would, you want to, what would you want someone to say to you if you were having a bad day? And he goes, oh, sorry, you're having a bad day. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's learning. That's social skills acquisition. That's empathy training. That's right. all of those things that are being mediated through technology. And if you stop the technology at the office, because we need to do the old traditional you talk, I talk, and we don't have any of this media technology, we're missing out. And that's what I think um, is my big concern, is we're missing out. So in a family session, maybe a phone rings and uh, a parent reaches for it, you have an opportunity then to process all of that with people and the issue of what's... What are the boundaries around technology that we set in our family? You know, for if I'm having an intimate talk with a kid and the phone rings and I answer, what's that feel like? What you know, and a chance to process that as a, a family system. If if we left the technology outside, we never get a chance to replicate what in fact is a family issue. Okay. Oh, and the stuff you see, um, <laughs> you know, the stuff you see. I mean, I've had parents literally reprimanding their child in, in an office with me saying, please, are you listening? He's talking. Oh, hold on one second. 
and then getting their cell phone and my saying, well, let's, let's stop there. You were just talking about how you were concerned that your child wasn't listening to me and what just happened when the phone rang for you? Um, and the kid, of course, would be like, yeah, yeah, they do that all the time. They do that all the time at home. And it then gives us a wonderful conversation and an opportunity to educate people about digital citizenship because the background for all this is five years ago this parent never had that thing that was ringing in their pants. They didn't have to know or yeah. learn how to negotiate with that. And I think we're all learning these how to integrate these huge powerful new technologies into our lives without any practice. Mm -hmm. any, like when I was growing up the party line, having a second line in the house, that was a big thing. Um, now, the party line is in your pocket and you're taking it with you. Yeah. So, so, Mike, one of the things I think about is, as you're talking is, um, I reflect back on a conversation I, I overheard at a, um, some reception I was at, and a, a social worker was bragging, um, a, a very skilled social worker I met, a very skilled clinician, bragging about the fact um, that, that she's not involved, that she doesn't do Facebook, she doesn't really do email, she doesn't do any of those things. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, what does that mean for who that person is in the lives of people who are struggling with these things? And I guess I'm curious your take on, if I'm someone who doesn't do any of those, you know, I think it's like 19% of Americans who don't do the internet. And that that's not mostly about whether I can or not. It's, all, it's usually about a choice. There are some folks who maybe don't have the resources, although interestingly they find access to, to the resource somewhere else. But people who say, I'm not going to do internet, I'm not going to do cell phone, I don't know what the hell that Facebook is, all of those things. Um, and then I show up in my office seeing clients. Um, how does that affect uh, my ability to um, be helpful in those situations? For, for, from your opinion, what, what do you think about that? Well, I think there are, there, I can think of no other example where people brag about being illiterate. That, um, you know, I think we've had campaigns about literacy and improving literacy. It's mm -hmm. considered something that's a hallmark of civilization. People that struggle with literacy initially feel bad about it. We have kids that become very um, engaged in acting out behaviors, partly because of the frustration of not being literate. Mm -hmm. um, and this, and th nobody says, well, yeah, it's okay for you to be illiterate because um, you know, we'll have someone else read for you for the rest of your life. We have a goal that we've adopted for society about literacy, and yet we have adults that are bragging about being digitally illiterate. Um, and I find that, first off, I'm concerned that they're bragging about uh, being illiterate, but I'm also concerned about them being, becoming irrelevant. That if 97% of people are using social media or playing video games, for example, that's my thing. 97% of the people you meet are playing video games. If you're refusing to learn what 97% of your patients are doing, then you're not meeting the client where the client is at. Um, you know, meeting the patient where the patient is at or the client where the client is at means knowing how to use the internet, means knowing how to talk with them about privacy settings, knowing how to talk with people about what a smartphone is or what it can do. So um, I, I would, I would imagine, or I would want to imagine, I guess, in some ways, that the person is saying that in a part as a response to fear. Because I think most people that I've met that are reluctant to use technology, behind the sort of defiance of it, you hear fear. Not, not totally unlike the, the acting out kid that, you know, if you kind of could ask him, look, if we had a magic wand and you could read, would you want to read? Most of them say, won't say, no, I, I want to remain illiterate for the rest of my life. I imagine that most of these people, that if you gave them the opportunity without shame to educate themselves about technology, I would hope that they would want to. If they don't, then I think that's an even bigger problem because, as I said, when you brag about being illiterate in a certain arena, it, I, I don't understand it. I don't know quite how to understand that. Well, I do think that there's a lot of fear that people struggle with and, and I, social workers um, especially, you know, because it, it's almost in the same category as math anxiety for a lot of the social workers I know. There's like a category of things in the world I can't do, I won't do, um, and there's a lot of fear and insecurities around that. But I do hear people where I, it feels more like a value statement to me, and I, maybe you, you started off by talking about 
mechanistic. Sometimes people think yes. of technology as, as, as mechanistic, and I think it comes from that perspective. It's like, I'm a people person, I don't do technology. Um, and that's sort of the statement people make. And yet, uh, you know, part of the question I ask someone like that is, do you use the telephone? Because that's technology. Um, and you're a big believer in handwriting letters to people. Well, that's technology. Uh, so it's, it's like we, we accept the technology that we grew up with or that has always been there for us and we're more comfortable. And then the newer things are the things that are destroying civilization. Right. Um, right. And, um, and so what, you know, when people have said to me that they can't imagine people meeting each other over you know, online and developing relationships, and I say, well, you know, in the 19th century, people would typically meet each other through letters, you know. I mean, they would correspond and entire relationships developed through letters before they actually would come together as a couple or as a friendship. Um, and that was an acceptable part of society. So how is this different? Because it really doesn't seem different to me. It just, it's faster. Right. It's faster and it's new and it's, it's uh, I think, scary. But what's interesting is that technology and the ability to make and use technology is part of what makes us human. So whenever I hear these mm -hmm. folks that are talking about how technology is dehumanizing us, it makes no sense because part of what we do as human beings is we make technology. We make it to amplify our ideas. We make it to collapse space and time so we can relate better to people. You know, if someone that you love moves across the country, you don't say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ever call you again because technology is eroding the fabric of our social lives. You basically learn how to use whatever the technology is. Mm -hmm. So there's a very circular argument, I think, being made here. And I do think that it is, in a lot of ways, fear-based. Because, and I, and I guess I'll, I'll just say that I think it's connected to a real problem we have with our education system, which is we try to train people that they need to be um, straight-A students. And more important, since being a straight-A student is so important, they need to identify as quickly as possible in high school and college the area that they get the A's in the best, and then silo down in that area of knowledge for the rest of their life. So I'm going to major in philosophy, and then I'm going to become a philosopher, and then I'm going to teach philosophy. And what happens is we, we forget how much failure is inherent early on in the learning process, because we figure out how to sort of section off our lives so that I never have to do calculus anymore and I never have to feel like a failure. Mm -hmm. And then along comes technology where if I start to try to play a video game, I'm failing 80% of the time and I can't tolerate that as a person. Oh, okay. And so I think we've raised entire generations of people who are afraid to fail to the point where they're siloing themselves into this little area of work. And I have to tell you, part of what I do when I'm not talking about technology is consult with therapists about growing their practice. And half of a good half of the therapists that I talk to who want to know about growing their practice really hate their jobs. They really want to be doing something else, but they're feeling trapped in it now because they spent all this time getting a degree, all of this energy building their practice, and now they have to do it in their minds. They don't think they can fail and start something different. And I think that started probably back when people were in third or fourth grade. Wow. Well, certainly when I think about people taking on technology now, because it changes so fast, you have to get used to feeling incompetent with things fairly regularly. Um, because right now, okay, I now know how to use this smartphone. And the new model comes out, and of course, they shift things around, or the update comes, and immediately, I don't know what's going on. And definitely have to get used to, to tolerating that. And, right. that. and that certainly isn't the way that we've geared people in our educational systems. Um, and our career tracks have been, you choose a career for life. Although right. the reality now is people are shifting careers multiple times over the right. course of a lifetime. But uh, that wasn't the model that sort of America was built on. Uh, and uh, certainly what we've heard is sort of um, uh, parents did who worked for the same company for many, you know, for an entire life and then and retired. Um, so tolerating failure, tolerating ambiguity, because that's the other thing with technology, is it does keep changing. And then there's this ambiguous space to sort of figure things out. I mean, that's one of the things about uh, virtual worlds that sort of intrigues me, is the space is so malleable, um, you can't rely on it to be the same from one moment to the next, let alone from one day to the next. Right. And, and yet, uh, I've gone back to virtual spaces that I've become attached to and then they're not there. And 
this whole sort of loss process that I go through, um, there's something about that whole experience that starts to put you in touch with the whole Buddhist concept of impermanence because yes. nothing exists for very long. And I do think that that could be very scary, particularly for people who haven't, I'm going to put my trauma therapist hat on here, but if I've gone through a lot of trauma in my life and I have very little sense of stability and safety in the world, yep. then this ever-shifting world could seem um, especially disruptive because it not only, um, you know, it disrupts my whole sense of safety in my whole world, not just around this piece of technology. You know, what, let me give a real quick example of something that's happened recently in a video game called World of Warcraft. <clears throat> and so World of Warcraft is this video game where you can play a number of different characters, and one of the kind of characters you can play is a wizard or a mage. And um, they frequently update World of Warcraft and make some changes. And so for years they were using a certain spell that allowed you to do this certain thing. And then they did a patch and they got rid of that spell. And now you can't do that thing anymore, and now there's a different spell. And I thought about that, and I thought about it, as strange as this may say, seem, as in terms of Alzheimer's. The idea of one day you can think and do certain things, and then the next day everything's changed, and you're not quite sure where you are or how to function in this world anymore. And you can bridge that gap of understanding if you play a video game and you talk with someone about playing a video game, they're, they're, I think that people that are hearing that story are going to relate. We've all had that moment where what we thought we knew how to do, or a function we thought we were used to doing, suddenly isn't available to us anymore. And how do we then go from there? What do we do? Um, because you can't write to World of Warcraft's company Blizzard and say, please bring it back. I've tried. You can. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, yeah. right? And, and so it, I, think what you're, I think what you're talking about here is, is, is very important, the shifting sands and how technology is constantly shifting. Uh, but I think we don't, I don't think we want to just tolerate this. I think we want to embrace it. And I, fa I think, in fact, our mandate as social workers has always been to embrace it. Um, when I went to graduate school, my thesis was not um, a clinical thesis, even though I was a clinician. I did a study of Jane, ha Jane Addams and the settlement movement because I thought it was always very interesting how social workers have this mandate to go to the places that are unfamiliar and to live there. That that's what the settlement movement was about. Not that you parachute in and then go back to your comfy su suburb. You live in that uncertainty. You live in those places that may scare you. And, you know, part of our technology has always been going and doing home visits, going to the places that scare us. And just because the places that scare us are now pixelated, I don't think we can stop. I think we just need to start transferring our skills. And again, I think what you hear us saying over and over again is these are transferable skills. You have the social work skills of going and the temperament and the value system of going to the places that scare you. Now go to technology because that's the latest place that's scaring you. Hmm. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, I, at the same time, I wonder if, uh, you know, virtual spaces have been talked about as the next frontier for immigration, um, and uh, that people are developing and creating various lives in places, and some people are making a living off of creating virtual products and selling them. Um, and I, I recently um, I did a blog post on a Disney Virtual World Toontown that was becoming obsolete. They were, Disney was doing away with it. And um, families were up in arms about this because it turned out that families were using this space, and I'm sure they're using tons of other virtual spaces, but this particular one was the one that was being closed as a place to connect with each other. And I think the, the story that touched me the most was a man who was divorced and his son was, I think, eight. And this was the place for them to spend time together because they were at a distance. And he said, you know, you can't call an eight-year-old and have a conversation on the telephone. Right. But you can go in and create these things together and do this together. And, and so the families were very upset that Toontown was, was being closed down because they, they had communities here, people they were connected to. And, um, and of course, Disney's perspective was they were hoping people would transfer to this other world. Um, 
And, you know, probably some of those people will and some won't, but it won't be the same. It won't be the same community. It won't be the same experience. And um, one of the people who commented on my blog raised a really interesting thought about this. I mean, we've accepted this because these are corporate spaces. These are run by businesses who are making a profit. And, and, um, and someone raised the question, I think it was Dorley, actually, Dorley M., um, you know, that maybe... Maybe that's not okay. Maybe there needs to be a bill of rights for people about these spaces. That if a corporation is going to shut it down, maybe there are some guidelines that need to be followed. That people need to be able to then export certain types right. of content and things. I mean, I know when I've thought about Second Life, where I've spent lots of time just having fun with people and connecting with people, and I think about that going out of business, I feel like, oh, I'm not going to have that avatar anymore who I now connect with, I now feel like is me. And being able to really export that would be something that would feel better to me. So then I wonder, does that, does that raise this question of, should we be advocating for things to help people with these transitions? Uh, I mean, certainly advocating for a bill of virtual rights, that's like, <laughs> it's a little out there maybe, but I don't know, is it really? I mean, when there's a compelling public good for something and say, well, you know what? Yeah, they have the right to do away with the space because obviously there's costs involved in that. But these are people's lives that are being affected by this. Mm -hmm. Is there an obligation there as well? Um, and I don't think anybody's asked those questions. Um, but I think there's sort of similar questions when I hear the UN starting to say that access to the internet is a human right. right. Um, and that when you start to look at how social um, change has been driven, uh, the Arab Spring, and that cutting people's access off is akin to cutting off public speech. Um, I think we're starting to raise some of those questions. And, well, we can say, yeah, it's okay to destroy these spaces, but uh, is it okay to go in and bulldoze a physical community? No. I mean, we say that there's at least in this, in this country a process you have to go through before you go in and, you know, uh, change a neighborhood. There's some due process built into that. Well, what does it mean as we start to think about virtual spaces and virtual communities? And I, um, those are the kinds of things that when I when I responded to her comment and suggested this, somebody else said, well, these are corporate spaces, you know, they pay, corporate, corporations pay for this. I said, well, that's true. But, you know, when there's a compelling public good, you have things that society says, well, that's tough. Corporations don't get to just do X, Y, and Z all the time. They have to operate within certain guidelines. And so I wonder whether or not technology is going to force us to start to ask those questions about some of these spaces. You know, I think that part of the, 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 the challenge here and, and part of what holds us back was you making this very important and I think eloquent argument, but couching it in terms of, I know this may sound far out. And I don't think it should sound far out. I think in a post-Cartesian society where we understand that mind and body aren't separate substances, that you don't have two brains, the brain that walks around in your body and the brain that experiences whatever the video game is doing or whatever the technology is doing. We have one brain. We have one limbic system. And things that impact us emotionally don't impact a set of fake virtual emotions. So that when somebody says to you, we're transferring your world, I mean, think about how chilling that would be if you actually accepted that, not as, oh, it's just virtual. The world as you know it is gone. We're transferring it. Mm -hmm. That's a stunning statement. And we, what gets in the way of people actually advocating about it is this little still small voice that's from back when Rene Descartes was alive and well saying, well, it doesn't really count. And if we think about the history of civil liberties, and if we think about the history of encroachment on civil liberties, it always happens not overnight, but with day after day of people saying, well, it doesn't really count. They're not really coming for me. Oh, it's really somebody else's problem. And so I think that one part of what you're saying um, that I, I, is that it's not far out. That, that the problem is we need to stop thinking of it as far out as if we have two different emotional cores. Um, because I don't think that's true. Now, the other piece that I think needs to be looked at here in, as part of people in a capitalist society and social workers that are in a host capitalist society is we, we have also a built-in sense of entitlement that somebody else needs to build a space for us. 
And the thing about Disney Toontown is because they're a corporation and because they've got a big brand name, they have enough draw to do what we call in social media and social networking, build a critical mass. Right. Okay. And the problem is we don't know how to build critical masses without the aid of corporations. Uh -huh. And that's, a, I think, a really big issue. Um, and that one of the things that's exciting about crowdsourcing and the things that we, you know, in terms of Occupy Wall Street, was people began to build intentional critical masses through the use of technology in a large part, I, I might add. The revolution does get broadcast. Well, let me back you up because crowdsourcing concept probably most people don't know really what that means. So yeah. can you elaborate a little sure. bit? Sure. Um, and crowdsourcing, and I'll do this a little tongue-in-cheek, crowdsourcing is often what academics would refer to as cheating or not doing your own work because we have this idea that we need to each sit in our own seat at our own desk and do our own little part and shine our own bright little light and compete with everybody else. And that if you actually worked as a group or a team and said, all right, I, I have a problem. I want some help with this. What, what are some people's ideas? And then people start offering these ideas. And then you have a crowd that has given you a, a source of inspiration and ideas that are much bigger than any one person. We have a very ambivalent attitude about that in our particular culture. Um, and one of the things I often talk about with my social work students, because our final exam is always a collaborative exam, that I always ask them to do something either via Google Docs or do a presentation together. Um, in my technology class, they design a game, and they do it as a class. And um, there's a lot of anxiety about this. And what I say to them is, when you get out into the real world as a social worker, and you're sitting at the Department of Health and Human Services doing a team meeting on a child, and the psychologist gives their psych report, psychology evaluation, and the psychiatrist gives an update on the meds, and they turn to you and they say, would you please, uh, Dr. Smith, tell us about the child's psychosocial functioning? You don't say, I can't tell you, that would be cheating. You're part of a team. And so crowdsourcing is the latest iteration, I think, of a, a different way of doing education and social work, where we're a team. And it's not about each of us shining or doing our own individual thing, but collaborating. And that we can do better work, greater work, by collaborating. Right, right. Uh, so there actually exists right now um, open access virtual worlds where people could go in and create these spaces for themselves uh, with, um, with some skills to do that. But the question about how you get that word out to attract the community, that's what Disney brings. Disney brings you know, its, um, its brand, its way of advertising, and then it also brings, it, when, you, when you see a corporation doing something, you have a level of quality expectation you expect as well. Uh, and I think uh, one of the issues with open sourcing is that um, you can be part of the process from the beginning, and at the beginning it may be very rough and it may take a while to evolve to a place that it's reaching a level of quality that people who don't know about programming might feel comfortable going in. I think I want to go back to also part of what you were talking about and, and kind of highlight these are relational worlds. Yes. These are relationships that are thriving in these curated virtual spaces. And I've seen different iterations of this. I have had parents who are stationed out of country in Iraq or Afghanistan that are playing World of Warcraft with their kids that live in the United States. Now, we've got this um, sort of circa 1950s model of family quality time, but we don't live in a world where everybody's in the living room playing Parcheesi. We have people fighting wars in different places. We have people that are separated by vast amounts of space and sometimes time. And we have the developmental needs of younger kids and adults who don't want to talk, um, that want to play together. And so th these curated spaces become these wonderful spots where people can actually play together. And I guess to highlight an example of one space that is not corporate, um, and that is Minecraft. Uh, Minecraft is this wonderful uh, software platform and game where you can, for I think it's like $20, download your own version of it and create these multiplayer servers. And I've actually participated for uh, on and off for two or three years with this hosted Minecraft community where I'm playing with educators and children 
from Australia, from England, from the United States, and watching them build things together and watching them argue and develop their social skills together. And the things that have been the formulas for success have been the, the, the curated space where they can play and have embedded activities to do social skills. And the second, even more important one, is that the adults leave them alone. That the adults don't jump in when there's a conflict. That the adults let them sort of hash it out. And we, there have been times when I've been seeing on the chat screen of this particular game, the, the name calling and the teasing and gritting my teeth because the social worker in me wants to get in there and let's, let's talk about it or how can you say that differently? But I don't and the other educators don't. And at a certain point, one of them says, hey, let's go build something together to fix what, you, what was broken. Or, hey, I can help you with that. And we watch them resolve the conflict. And so I think those are examples of how we can have those curated spaces mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily brought to you by Disney. I would love to see social workers starting to set up group Minecraft servers so that they can actually do social skills building embedded in activities because mm -hmm. I mean how many curriculums can we make kids do um, and how many worksheets can we have kids do they're boring well and, and uh, the, the beauty of Minecraft and um, my kids are really into Minecraft the beauty of it is that uh, you can play it in so many different ways kids can create things together which could involve bringing lots of research in about, you know, well, what do castles really look like from the Middle Ages, and what are some of the challenges for that, uh, learning some of the issues in architecture in terms of planning, and then, of course, the whole social interactive part that you're talking about. But I think it's interesting to me how the virtual spaces become, uh, move out into uh, our, our physical spaces. Uh, we took uh, kids to uh, uh, some sort of a puppet making thing with paper mache and didn't uh, didn't one of the kids create one of those um, zombie monster things that are in, in Minecraft I forget what they're called. Zombie pigmen? Yes, <laughs> and it, so we now have one of those physically sitting around it's painted and it's you know and this Minecraft character that sits sits in the house in addition to going into the virtual spaces because the kids they're really all one and the same. Yeah. Um, I don't think I don't think we're in a post-Cartesian society. I think we like to think we are, but I don't think the society's there yet. I mean, I think uh, medicine isn't there yet. The understanding of mind-body is only just still emerging now, and you find various responses to it. And I think when I look at even our television commercials that are all about, you know, if you have a stress, if you have a headache, take a pill. That is not a true sense of mind-body. But I think it's emerging, and that's part of why this conflict is being played out with technology as well because I think technology will raise it for us. That's what gets me excited about technology is when I start to hear um, people doing things in virtual spaces which change their lives in their physical spaces, which I build my sense of confidence which now comes out. And because I'm the same person, I'm having feelings, whether it's an image on a screen or the image my brain is processing in this room, they're both images to my brain. My brain doesn't know the difference between those. But when I say that to people, they look at me like, really? The brain responds the same way in that virtual space? Yeah, it does. Because people don't believe that most of our reality is just created internally. They really do think the physical reality is the truth and it's separate from the mind. Um, and I don't think our society's really accepted that yet, although the neuroscience is starting to come out to support that um, in big ways. Um, that the brain, you know, that I can sit here, close my eyes, and imagine, you know, lifting weights. And if I really see that clearly enough, I will actually show some, some muscle gain as a result of doing that. That blows people's minds when I tell them that research. But that's virtual spaces. So um, I do think that, that this technology will be part of pushing us further into a post-Cartesian world. I don't know if it will happen in my lifetime or not, but it's certainly part of the challenge now, I think, for people. And, and maybe, the, maybe kids who are growing up using it won't have the, the challenge in quite the same way that uh, people of our generation might struggle with because it, um, it's been new to us. It's not something that, um, that we can accept quite as easily, or some of us can't. I mean, to, to me, it's, it's all molecules, you know, and uh, the virtual world, physical world, um, 
the physical world is no more permanent than the virtual world is. They're basically one and the same. But uh, I can't step into the computer yet. But the technology actually to, to do that, to actually feel yourself physically fully in that space, is already here. You know, since you've already started talking about neuroscience and Minecraft, I want to kind of, I want to kind of go back to that a little bit. <clears throat> because one of the ways I've actually used Minecraft, Minecraft, actually two ways, um, one way has been to help kids that may be on the spectrum understand theory of mind. And for those of you who aren't familiar, theory of mind is basically a fancy way of saying, you know, the idea that I have a mind and you have a mind inside your body that's like mine, that you and I have some sort of similar subjective experience. And it's one of the basis for empathy. And one of the things about Minecraft is you have, you can play the game in a first person view where you don't see yourself at all, you just see what you're experiencing, much like what you're doing now when you're watching this video. You're not watching yourself watching the video. And that's the first person. And in Minecraft, you also have the ability to do the third person, which would pan it so that you see yourself walking around in the world doing things. And they're parallel to, uh, in some ways, the agentative self and the representational self. And so one of the things that happens when you play multiplayer is you can have a kid be playing in their first person and seeing these other objects, these other people, but then have them shift it into third person where they see themselves and, and help them understand. See, just like you may look like a person that's out there, but you're also really a subjective, agentative self, those other objects out there have selves like you. And kids can actually get this theory of mind in a visual way because they've been playing Minecraft. Um, the other thing in terms of neuroscience that I think is useful is helping parents understand attention and helping a parents understand, um, maybe even more importantly, distraction. And for that, I talk with uh, parents and kids about the creeper. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the creeper, the creeper is this green creature in Minecraft that sort of sneaks up on you. And if you don't get away from it, the creeper explodes and you die. And what happens is any sort of loot or stuff you had acquired while you were playing the game gets scattered. And it's just sort of all over the place wherever you died. And you have to kind of you get resurrected somewhere else. And you have to run back to where you were and try to get all your, your stuff together. And I tell parents, that's what's happening to your child when they're on the computer and they may be doing their homework or they may be playing a game. And you go over and you say, what are you doing? You're the creeper that just blew up. And whatever they were doing, it can take them up to 30 minutes. For, you know, we know that when people are disrupted from a task, it can take them up to 30 minutes. So do you really, really need to know what they're doing on the computer? Is it worth them not being on task for 30 minutes for homework? And it really helps a lot of parents sometimes see that they may actually be part of the homework problem. That part of the homework hmm. problem is their constant monitoring is actually being the creeper that's blowing up all the cognitive loot that the kid <laughs> is trying to acquire. So those are two examples of how playing a video game or thinking analytically about a video game can help kids understand things about their own abilities and their own cognitions and help parents understand things about kids' cognitive abilities and study skills. Well, it actually reminds me of what people would do with play therapy sometimes uh, because you can lay out a whole space and show people relationships and you can just do that in a video game and the beauty of that is that there is so much more control that you can actually bring into the environment and shape it uh, and you can bring in other people which of course is a, uh, an advantage to the space disadvantage too depending on what you're trying to do but um, that's that back to that idea of that, that projective space I wonder if this would be uh, a time for us maybe to take a little bit of a break and sort of reflect and see whether there's other things we want to come back to. Um, what do you think? No, I think that's a good idea. So okay. why don't we take a break for a few minutes?